Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. Dot. Um. <laughs> This evening, I have the pleasure of speaking with an animator who's lived all over Texas and even in California for a little while that's just now put out a animated feature uh, called Attack of the Demons, which has a very 90s liquid television MTV vibe. Eric Power, how are you? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Hey, man. Thanks for talking to me. I dug it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, we talked briefly in a brief interview uh, or pre-interview sh exchanging emails that uh, Li Liquid Television was a big influence on you growing up and that uh, it gave you hope for more adult style animation, especially also when you found Japanese anime. Um, what was the catalyst to, to go from, uh, you know, animation in the 90s that was primarily targeted at people 12 and under to realizing that there was an adult market? Uh, well, I guess it, for me, like I said, it started with uh, watching Japanese anime. I remember going to the video store as a kid and there'd be like a small selection at like Hollywood video or blockbuster video where, um, you know, I saw like Wicked City or uh, Akira and then um, later in the 90s, Ghost in the Shell. And um, those films resonated pretty uh, strongly with me because they were telling adult stories um, it wasn't just about like um, violence and mayhem and uh, subversiveness or anything. It was um, more um, philosophical, uh, particularly like Ghost in the Shell and Akira. Um, that made me think um, that you can tell m mature stories in the medium of animation just as you would live action. And um, so I always kept that in my head uh, when thinking about animation moving forward. And it wasn't years uh, until years later that I decided that I could actually make a feature animation of my own. And um, I mean, adult and adult films are kind of like my thing. I love genre cinema. I love samurai films. You know, horror is like my thing. I love it. And so it was kind of a no brainer to um, try it, you know, just try it and see uh, how it would do. <laughs> right. And then Attack, of the, or Attack on the Demons isn't your first animated horror feature. I believe uh, the first one was, um, bear with me, what was it called? It was... Uh, Path of Blood. <laughs> Path of Blood, that's the one. Yes. You know, uh, When you do something like that and then you keep the tradition going, uh, you know, it's not scary and it's not gory in a sense, but there is that level of suspense. Are you more of a suspense, bu a suspense guy or are you more of like the torture porn uh, crowd? Um, well, you know, I guess I'd say more suspense. I mean, it's fun animating gore and like i feel like with path of blood i had like 30 plus decapitations <laughs> you know i was like kind of going for it and having fun with it uh, but really for me it's just like telling uh, good stories you know in the in the genre of horror or you know kind of uh, I, don't know. I guess the path of blood is more like action um but yeah i mean I, it's hard to say i don't want to like pin myself down because i kind of want to make films like in like a wide variety of genres even I like a couple kids films I want to make um, but I do like to kind of let loose with the gore <laughs> when I can <laughs> so Attack of the Demons is like the perfect opportunity to do that right and it does have a bit of that old school late again late 90s uh, South Park stop motion uh, cardboard cutout animation take us through the animation process of this did you actually do the stop motion motion cutouts or was this yeah. digitized to look that way no, no, this was, um, this was straight up paper, um, cut and animated top down, like I'm showing you now, like here's like a prop from something I'm working on. <laughs> um, yeah, it's all um, hand cut by myself and then shot uh, top down a tripod pointing uh, down at my surface and then uh, manipulated frame by frame. And then, but I use uh, digital techniques to composite the images together. Um, so it's kind of like a marriage of traditional animation with um, 21st century technology just to make it, you know, like doable, basically. Wow, that's intense, man. That's got to be labor intensive on top of everything else. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, you know, you're married and your wife Alicia is in the movie uh, yes. as, one of, as one of the characters as well. Uh, what is making a movie like this, especially stop motion, you got to draw every piece and cut it out. 
paste it together and move it about, you know, frame by frame. What type of toll does that take on the relationship? Or is she standing there with you the whole time helping you co-direct? Um, well, she was great. She's always uh, been kind of like the unofficial editing supervisor because she's the first one I take my edits to, to be like, does this work? I mean, there's a lot of anxiety as a filmmaker um, just during the process because you don't, it's hard to work in a vacuum. And since I am making this stuff um, myself or animating it and storyboarding it and all that, um, it's important to have somebody to bounce it off of. So I definitely relied on her and then also uh, my screenwriter a partner, Andreas, who I would send edits to, and um, my composer, John. But it was such a small crew um, that, yeah, it was important to just like share with each other and get the edits flowing. And uh, I don't feel like the uh, there's any toll on the relationship because, for one, I'm working, like if you can see, like, <laughs> this is my house so I'm home all the time so and I got three kids and uh, they're always running back here and you know they're crafting over in the corner while I'm crafting on my film and we're interacting and talking so it, it's not like I'm um, shut off um, under a rock somewhere like inaccessible like I'm, I'm here <laughs> so it, it's been great <laughs> so your normal life is quarantine Basically, yeah, like when uh, this whole uh, virus started, uh, I was thinking this doesn't really change too much for me, like from a work basis, although I did lose jobs um, from it, but that's just, uh, you know, <laughs> I could still like do the work. It's just, um, it like destroyed a lot of some industries that I rely on, particularly the music industry. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm still here able to work <laughs> at least. <laughs> well, that's the important thing. And hopefully we get back to some sort of normalcy where people can work more uh, leading into 2021. Uh, yeah. Did you write, did you and Andreas write the majority of the music for the film? Not the music. No, John Dixon uh, wrote the score for it. And I worked with him on Path of Blood as well. He's been a, a friend of mine for a really long time. And uh, he rocked that score and he rocked this. I tried not to um, give him too much uh, like creative. I, I, I wanted him to be able to just sort of like go nuts with it, you know, uh, because I trust him so much. And so I gave him like a couple of um, kind of ground lines. Like I'm thinking I want a lot of like fuzzy guitar and I want like a 70s sort of um, rough vibe to it, sort of like demons. Um, but other than that, um, I just sort of let him go crazy and just sort of instinctively he seemed to already know how the film sounded and um, man that the scores I love it <laughs> it's one of my favorite parts just listening to the music dude the score fits uh, the imagery is there it really felt like I was back in 1994 um, oh, thank you that's, that's yeah. a big big year for me <laughs> growing up <laughs> what, what made it so special for you uh, that was like the year, you know, Terminator 2 was out, Mortal Kombat was all the rage, you know. Uh, I was just sort of, I was young. I mean, I was born in 82, so I guess I was like um, 10 years old, or no, 12 years old. And I think that's a pretty good age to sort of get an idea of the things you like, you know. And I was digging all the stuff I saw around that time, and I feel like uh, I... I purposely sort of wanted to pay a little homage to that. That's why Jeff is playing Nine Realms, which is sort of like a Mortal Kombat 2 sort of game. And just to bring me back to that time. So it was very much an early 90s kind of vibe I was going for, even though a lot of the influences happened to be 80s and 70s. <laughs> well, that does sound like the 90s, let's be honest. But uh, like, are, yeah. <laughs> you, are you a bit more like the Chet character in, in the film or, you know, which, which character do you see yourself most in? Uh, I mean, it's tough to say. I think I'm Natalie and Kevin and Jeff, like the mains, uh, because I, I, I love shoegaze music. <laughs> it's like one of my things. I'm like really into the, that stuff, uh, like Natalie. And I'm a big time movie nerd. Obviously, I mean, I make movies and I also am a, I've been a gamer, you know, all my life. And uh, I mean, even like video games, I would say were almost just as important as movies are to the way I um, tackle my own projects. Like when I thought of Attack of the Demons originally, I was thinking, how cool would it be to have like a side scrolling beat em up, like tie in video game, or even maybe a video game that acted as the sequel to the film? Um, you know, so. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm obsessed with all three of those things. 
Well, these days, video games might as well be movies. That's true. <laughs> That's very true. Like Last of Us hit me on a, like a very emotional level. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you sit there, you you produce the film, you directed the film, you co-wrote the film, you animate the film. Um, this is obviously a labor of love for you. And it seems that Texas is starting to finally get recognition as a hub for movie making. I mean, San Antonio Film Festival, uh, Houston, Austin, you know, all these places are starting to, to get recognized. Why did it take so long for Texas to get recognized? And then the follow-up to that is, um, how difficult is it for you as a filmmaker, because you co-wrote this and, and put it all together, uh, to not be married to the written word on the page when you're trying to animate something? Uh, well, first, I would say that um, co-writing is an overstatement. Andreas did. I, I owe so much to him for uh, writing the script. I came to him with a very basic idea that he like fleshed out and built all the characters off of. Um, I wish I was a good writer, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just lucky to, to know him and to be working with him on other projects as well. Uh, Texas, I mean, yeah, it's fantastic right now, particularly Austin. I mean, we've got uh, like several animation studios that are getting really big. And uh, I mean, I'm just some one, one dude doing stuff out of my garage, but I've uh, met with some of these folks like the um, Powerhouse Animation that did like Castlevania and all that. Uh, I went there and hung out with them for a little bit. And just amazing stuff going on in Austin. Um, I mean, uh, Texas in general has a pretty good history of just sort of like indie film. We've got like Richard Linkletter, you know, starting the whole thing with Slacker back in the day. And there's a lot of exciting stuff, but um, I mean, historically, California was where the industry was. And now that technology has gotten to us to a place where geography isn't as important, I feel like um, Texans were always there and ready to like do the work and we're still here and um yeah ready for it um what's, what's the second part of the question <laughs> oh just why did it take so long for texas to get recognized and that as part of the first part and then the second part is uh how difficult is it to divorce yourself from the written word if you're one of the co-writers on it trying to direct something because it, I, i've always seen that it might be difficult if the person is the writer and the director because they want to either make it fit or shoehorn it in because they thought that like it was too good not to be a part of the film, even though it visually didn't fit the narrative. Right. Well, I mean, there were there were certainly instances that uh, I felt I could visually tell the story in ways that might not have been in the screenplay, and I added a couple of sequences in um, here and there. But for the most part, I took it on as a challenge to try to translate Andreas's word to the screen as best I could. And um, yeah, I, I, the thing with Andreas, uh, I felt like the way he wrote spoke to me in a way to where it felt very natural the whole time. So I never felt like I was fighting the screenplay or anything like that, you know? And uh, I was just kind of sharing ideas with him back and forth. And we're like, yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, let's do that, you know? Or the thing you wrote is crazy and I don't think I can animate that because I don't have enough time in the world. <laughs> you know, there were definitely instances of that. Uh, like you've, you've seen where the film goes, it gets like pretty big, you know? Yeah. And that was very intimidating for me because how do you make something feel that big with like freaking cut out paper, you know? Um, so yeah, there was definitely challenges and also just like a crazy time crunch because I made this thing over the course of one year with very, very little money. And um, yeah, just like cranking out shots as fast as I could. Sometimes like 150 shots in a month that had to be done and composited um, so that I can get the edit um, ready for John to do the score. So it was, it was like the whole thing was like a huge crunch. <laughs> and how many people helped you animate it? Or is this all you by yourself? No, no, no this is me. <laughs> I cut it out and animated it myself. Wow. <laughs> and edited it and I had to do the sound design. <laughs> So, so you did the sound design and the animation yourself in a year with, with no outside help in, at all, or yeah, at least all very minimal. Stuff, all that stuff's my fault. So all the, everything that people, if they hate it, then yeah, it's all, all on me. <laughs> uh, yeah, but once they find stuff out like that, man, that makes it even more impressive. So even if they don't like the story per se, they can still be impressed by the level of effort that went into making that, especially being a one-man studio. Yeah, that, that, that would be great. I mean, um, I, I'm always about the mantra that 
uh, to make a film, just kind of go out and make it despite the odds, you know, like I would have loved to have a huge budget and bring on like voice actors. Like in my first uh, dream, I wanted like Elijah Wood to play Jeff, you know, like, oh, that'd be so great. I love Elijah Wood. <laughs> but of course, you know, we, we couldn't do that. Like um, we could keep the lights on in the studio and that's basically it. <laughs> so we're like, work with what you have and make a film and have fun with it. And, you know, you're making something with your friends. And I'm just so, so fortunate that it actually got distribution. And, you know, I'm talking to you today. <laughs> it's like a miracle. I'm glad that it got distribution because this was fun. Because, I've you know, I cover a lot of film festivals. And, I, and there's stuff that is so great at these things that never come out. And it's heartbreaking. And the fact that you have this movie that you put together by yourself with a close friend of yours that wrote it. You have your wife in it. He's at, the writer's acting in it. You have the the uh, you have John doing the music and the musical score. Like this is really like a four or five person team and the few voice yeah. actors that you have that are close friends of yours. So besides being a labor of love, to get the distribution on top of it has to be like considered a major victory. Yeah, it it definitely is. Um, you know, me and Andreas were talking about it, and we're all stressed out, and you know, it's being released and put into the world, and it's our little you know passion project. Um, but he reminded me, you know, at the end of the day, we've already won <laughs> because I mean, our film's out there, like that's a big win. And, you know, it's thanks to like people like Josh Goldblum, who um, he's the one responsible for the film getting out there. He saw it and put it in an apocalypse last year. He uh, called me up several months after that and was like, hey, I'd like to be your sales rep. I think you have something cool here. I don't want to share with the world. And um, yeah. I mean, we got super lucky and that's uh, a lot of it, you know, it's luck and it's passion and it's hard work and hopefully those things line up. And if they don't, you try again, like with Path of Blood, like I didn't, I didn't make it with that film. It's my first feature, um, but it got me to the point where I was introduced to Andreas because of it. And you just sort of like pick yourself up and you just keep working and hope, <laughs> I want to I make more films. So I plan to. Well, you're doing something right, man, especially getting distribution with a four person team. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you got the call that you got distribution, um, you know, because there's always that fear that it's not going to happen. Uh, yeah. But you get the call, the distribution's coming, you, you signed a deal, it, it's going out into the world. What's your first reaction? Because th that's a big step for somebody who's only made two other films, one being a documentary about LARPing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, um, it was exciting, but... You know, I mean, I did get distribution with Path of Blood and on DVD, it, it didn't go to VOD. So there's apprehension there, like how far is this going to spread? Because Path of Blood didn't spread too far. And I mean, even now, like it, it came out today on election night. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure how it's going to go. And I don't have funding for my next film secured by any means. So everything's still definitely up in the air. And um, we're just waiting to see what happens. Well, I, I'm thrilled for you, man, because this was a fun movie. It definitely felt like liquid television, MTV era, 1994. Um, you know, it could have easily been a short that, that got translated to a feature, which, which you did. Uh, the movie altogether is an hour and roughly 15 minutes, but for stop motion with one person to do it by themselves and in a year, that, that's really impressive. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, are both you and Andre, I know you said you were a horror fan, but is Andreas a horror fan? And how did the story develop and, and where did this come from? Like, did you pitch him the story idea or did he come to you with it? Like, like take us to the early stages of Attack on the Demons. Yeah, um, he's definitely a huge horror fan. He grew up, like, his parents, he said, um, like had a huge collection of like VHS tapes and they were always very supportive of his love of, um, you know, film and horror so um, he had access to that growing up and I came to him with the idea I had a very loose concept of it and back in 2011 um, I just had an idea of a town being overrun by demons and I had like the three main characters and I knew that they were interested in music movies and film and I knew that eventually they ended up at a kind of survivalist uncle's like crazy cabin um, but that's about it I didn't know the lore behind it or anything like that. And so I kind of told him that idea and he liked what he heard. And then he brought his own sensibilities and fleshed it out. So, you know, 
basically, I mean, it, it's still a collaboration, but it's like a 60, 40 collaboration at this point. You had, it was like basically Stan Lee and Steve Ditko coming up with Spider-Man. Like you had the rough, rough design and then he brought in and filled out the colors with the pages. And then you came back and, and brought it all to life. Um, yeah, maybe with that film, uh, definitely the, like future collaborations. Um, I, there's a lot of stories that he uh, wrote all himself that I've fallen in love with, and was like, I want to, I want to make, <laughs> I want to visualize this too. So um, I consider us more like the uh, Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> well, who's got the better hair then? <laughs> well, I mean, it's hard to deny I've got the better hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, between Sorry. you and me, that's true. But I don't know about Andreas. <laughs> I haven't met the guy yet. <laughs> Sorry, Andreas. <laughs> no, man, but you're having a good time. You got three kids. Uh, you said you wanted to do a, do a children's thing. Is this inspired because of your children? Or is this something that you've always wanted to do on top of it all? Uh, I mean, I feel like it's been something I've been wanting to do. Um, but definitely spurred on by fatherhood. Uh, but I mean, like the one I really want to do isn't even a children's film. It's more like a young adult film. It's a film for my kids when they are 20 <laughs> or like in mid twenties, kind of um, just talk, trying to talk to them preemptively of, you know, the, the hardness of life, some, you know, cause life can get hard for sure. Yeah. That, that's yeah, for sure, man. It's, children, it's suitable for children. There's no like heads exploding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then well, I also have like a straight up children's film, but um, I'm not sure when all this stuff's going to be realized. It's hard to say. Well, how old are your kids now? Uh, six, four, and two. They are definitely a little too young for Attack on the Demons right now. Yeah, yeah. They've all, I've chased them around with like paper props and stuff, like the bear, you know, like, oh, it's going to get you. But I haven't let them watch it like <laughs> in full yet or anything. <laughs> you know, with it being stop motion and cardboard cutouts, what was the most difficult scene for you to to create and then which one was the most rewarding when you finally saw it in the final product uh man that's that's, also, that's a tough question i guess the difficulty would have been um towards the end uh with Haberim is uh, kind of rising um i don't know i don't know if i want to spoil anything <laughs> but uh, there's this a uh, big thing that happened. Uh, no major spoilers you know just uh, just enough to entice people Right. Big thing happens towards the end and I didn't know if I could pull it off. And I was very happy that I felt like I, I pulled it off like uh, enough. <laughs> it worked out even though it was tough. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess uh, things that surprised me and pleased me was the conversation in the diner uh, when they're talking about the things they love, you know, I was I wasn't sure how that would um, work out because um, I mean prior to this I had never done um, like a dialogue scene that heavy in my films I had Path of Blood but it wasn't as uh, in depth of a conversation you know so even like just a simple dialogue scene uh, was challenging and I was pleased to feel when I watched it that hey you know this kind of works I liked it. Well, you know, I mean, on, Andreas pulled it off because it felt really conversational. It didn't fe have that feel of like, and this is what I would have said. And back then I probably would have said this and that would have been my response. Like it wasn't a manufactured conversation. It actually felt real. Like, yeah. Kevin, you know, Kevin talking about some indie film that nobody wants to watch from 1970 something. You right. know, <laughs> your character being like, I haven't played this video game yet. And I got, you know, and Chet doing that. And then Natalie is like, oh, there's this indie band that no one ever wants to see. And like my, you know, whoever is with me thinks I'm a lunatic for liking this style of music. So like, it was all like sort of 90s misfit, but like yeah, totally. totally relatable. Yeah, and that, that's how I felt, felt growing up in the 90s. Like I had my little small group of people and we were kind of on the out, outcasts of like what was the norm, you know, kind of doing our crazy, you know, rocker thing. <laughs> so I was definitely tapping into some of that. I got you, man. No, that makes it, but that makes it more fun because then it becomes more legitimate. You know, when, uh, when you can pull from your own life experiences, I think that makes the, the art pop more instead of something that's manufactured. Yeah. And the, the characters are really important. I wanted to make sure that they, they felt real. I tried to approach the film as if it was live action. So, um, maybe to a fault, like I, I know that the, it's like, animated horror films aren't really made 
And I wanted to make one that felt like a real horror film. And so I, maybe I was trying to kind of like think of it uh, visually as a live action film, you know, the way the shots move and the way the characters act and all that. Um, I'm excited to try to do like pure animation um, next, you know, I've got this concept for uh, a story involving all woodland creatures <laughs> like foxes and wolves. And um, it's also very violent and uh, very traumatic. But that's something that would be very, very difficult to do with live action. So it'd be kind of fun to sort of like push myself like, okay, you've, you've tried to do live action horror. Now, you know, um, show them what you can do with animation, you know, try to push it a little further. I dig it, man. Plus the forest isn't that safe anyway. That's true. <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> you know, people think it's all Snow White and Cinderella and, dance, and dancing bears and singing birds and whatever. But no, it's pretty dangerous out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the movie came out on October 30th in virtual theaters and did it, did it make a drive through a uh, drive-in theater run as well or? No, I, I didn't see that happening. Um, but it's out today, November 3rd on VOD. Um, interesting timing for, uh, the United States at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, was that, was that something that, that your distributor decided on? Because, you know, Let's be honest, politics is kind of horrific. All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it was up to the distributor. I didn't have a, a real say in it. So um, I think they were trying to give people something else to do to, or to take their mind off of things, you know, a little catharsis. <laughs> and what's been the general reaction? Because I enjoyed it, and then someone referred to it as South Park meets the evil dead. You know, so yeah. that, that's got to be fun, especially the Sam Raimi comparison. Right, yeah. I mean, Evil Dead was certainly an influence. I mean, they end up in a cabin at the end. It's not, it's not a coincidence. <laughs> um, I'm pretty happy with the reaction. A lot of people have, you know, resonated with it. People have had their fair criticism, which I've accepted and um, learned from, you know. I mean, it's, uh, filmmaking is a collaborative sort of experience. You know, you make a film and you put it out there and you hear what people think and, you know, maybe you incorporate stuff. Um, definitely, um, they pointed out some things and like, hey, yeah, that's a, that'd be a pretty good idea. Or like, oh yeah, I should have done that. Or just wait, because I've got a plan for that, you know? <laughs> just like different reactions, you know, across um, the spectrum. Right. So, I mean, it, it's crazy. It's just crazy. I'm not used to, um, you know, having so many people interacting with my art. I've done a lot of music videos and usually, you know, getting comments on YouTube or various things. So, I mean, it's really refreshing to see like very in-depth criticism of something uh, me and my small team have done. And um, yeah, I've made a lot of friends along the way. So it's good stuff all around. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. It makes things work for you. Um, do yeah, you play music yeah. by any chance? I don't. Uh, I wish I was more musically talented. <laughs> okay. <laughs> fiddle around on the ukulele a little because <laughs> one thing's I, one thing i tend to ask fighters musicians and professional wrestlers is that they're usually getting instant gratification with with their crowd reaction but with mm -hmm. filmmakers you know you put a year into your life into something and then all of a sudden now it's in the world and then you get a reaction whether people enjoyed it or didn't um how difficult is that delayed gratification when you put your whole being into something like this? It's um, incredibly painful. <laughs> and I get a lot of anxiety from it. I, I made the film two years ago and it's just now being released. Like that's a, that's a long time to wait for something that, you know, I, you spent a whole year making and then you have to wait two more years, you know, just to let people see it. And it's rough because I could have made a whole other film in those two years, but you know? Uh, but I'm just sort of waiting to see how this one does. And then, you know, you don't get the trust of investors until they see how your other film performs. And, um, yeah, the whole thing, it's, it's very stressful. Plus, I'm watching people's reaction to a film I made two years ago. In that two-year time, I've gotten really quite a bit better at my craft. <laughs> so I'm, I'm watching it being like, this is obsolete stuff. I'm so much better now. <laughs> you know, I've got this trick and that trick and just wait till you see my next work. I made that whole thing on like a 10 year old laptop and I've got a, like a new computer now. So <laughs> it's like, just, just wait guys. But um, they're gonna have to wait another two years probably. <laughs> 
Wait, wait, wait. You, you made Attack on the Demons on a 10-year-old laptop with old technology basically three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> or at least starting three years ago. Yeah, yeah. I had to fight with that laptop. I was asking it to do way too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you bust out the, uh, the 480, you know, <laughs> we'll see how that works back from 1995. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I've got some 480p stuff. <laughs> <laughs> when the, you know, now the now that it's out and the reaction is is coming in and you you know, how is your confidence level coming about because clearly there's my reaction and other people's reactions that have enjoyed the film and now realizing that it was such a small team I enjoy it even more. Um because for me when an indie film has you know, not just a smaller budget, but, you know, a smaller crew and everything else that goes into it. I'm far more impressed than something that had a year and a half to film with $400 million. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like when it, when it's something like this and it's pushed forward and still comes out really well, it's, it's 10 times more impressive. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, um, that's something that, I mean, it'd be, it'd be great to, um, let people know, you know, the the way we made it and, you know, the struggle involved, because I'm sure a lot of people wonder why we didn't like hire professional voice actors, you know, or why the sound design um, wasn't a little more, had more umph to it, you know, mm-hmm. and I mean, it, a lot of it comes down to just sort of budget and time. And so, you know, if a potential investor producer sees this and realizes that it was made like very, very cheaply and very, very quickly, by a small amount of people, maybe they'll be interested in wondering what we can make with uh, just like a little bit more, you know, <laughs> and we got plans. So, and also, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really all about just sort of inspiring other people to do the same, you know? Um, so it's almost nice to not be treated like I like we did it ourselves like let's let people feel like there's a lot of people involved and just let it stand like see where it stands you know uh, against the big guys the ones with like millions of dollars and uh, if one of these young uh, kids that wants to be a filmmaker animator sees that and they're like and then they it kind of dawns on them like oh crap like such a few amount of people made this then they might feel extra inspired to do it themselves and then I think we'll see a renaissance of new animation and new small budget films coming out that are full of heart um, where people can tell the stories that they wanted to tell and not have to convince people to give them like huge amounts of money to do that. Well, I mean, it, it's fantastic to find out the story behind this and how, how you put it together. I'm really impressed with all of that. that. That means so much more to me than sitting there and going, someone gave me $40 million and said, have at it. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my rig, it's, it's like held together with like bungee cords and duct tape. So <laughs> this is a low budget effort. <laughs> so, so what you're telling me is the next low budget effort is there's going to be a documentary about the low budget effort. <laughs> yeah, with Path of Blood, I made like a mini documentary, uh, like how I made it. And it's on YouTube. Um, you can look at it. It's called Paper Cuts. But um, yeah, I might go into the detail. Like I kind of wished I um, recorded more behind the scenes. So I could have shown people like how it was done, you know, but I was so busy just trying to get the shots and get the quotas that it was very difficult to like do something like that on the side. Well, man, for, for the limited budget you had, for the way it was put together and for people complaining about the voice acting, the voice acting went perfectly well with the stop motion that you did. So it was <laughs> definitely 1994. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was happy with the, the voice actors, for sure. I mean, they, they did their best, and um, it was, I made it hard on them, <laughs> for sure. But it fit the story, and there, there's a bit of melancholy in their delivery, but again, that was 1994. You know, you have, you have that going in there. So it, it's really legit. It's really true to the time period. Um, and it, it's hard to make a modern-day horror film because everybody has cell phones now. So, right. you know, oh, this happened. And then the only trope that you can use is there's no signal or the battery died. And there's only right. so much of that you can use in every film. Yeah, I was trying to work around that because I wanted the characters to be isolated and make it believable, which is why I chose, you know, Colorado kind of valley mountain town with one entrance. I lived in Colorado briefly and I uh, remember driving into some of these towns where you go through like an underground tunnel and there's like this small quaint town, you know. 
like, wow, if uh, shit hit the fan here, like, they'd be fucked <laughs> because there's no way out. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was inspiring. So wait, there are actually towns in Colorado that are underground or like by- not, not underground, but like there's limited ways in, you know, <laughs> my whole, whole idea was, you know, like they're isolated and, you know, if people had cell phones, like there goes the isolation, <laughs> you just call in the national guard. <laughs> I got you, man. Um, let's say you get double the budget that you made Attack on the Demons for. Um, what type of project do you want to do next with that, with that amount of budget? Well, I have a few options uh, depending on uh, what people are interested in. If they resonate with Attack of the Demons, I've got another horror film that pushes things a little bit farther. It's a little scarier. It's a little bit more avant-garde or um, kind of art house horror. Um, I would say it's something um, kind of in the vein of like Spectre Vision might want be interested in. Or um, I've even thought A24. <laughs> it's like wishful thinking. Um, but I've got, we, have, we have this idea for something that's pretty, pretty out there, but also I think pretty scary and inspired by um, Japanese horror and a psychedelic um, work from the 70s. And then I've got another one, the one I mentioned earlier, that's all woodland creatures. And that's more of kind of like a fun, um, hyper-violent, sort of like a, I've, I've called it, the way I've described it is it's Inside Lewin Davis meets Disney's Robin Hood by way of Shogun Assassin. And that's like the best way I can describe this film. Um, super violent with, um, kind of like a folk soundtrack through the whole thing, like live performances <laughs> with animated creatures and uh, just like a huge amount of heart. And I'm, both of those films are high up on the ones I want to make. <laughs> and there's a lot of others. Okay, now that one I want to see. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about that one. <laughs> uh, Eric, before I let you go, uh, where can we find you on social media if we want to connect and where can we find Attack of the Demons? All right, so uh, I'm Eric Power Up on all the social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and then ericpowerup.net is you know, where you can find all my stuff. I do like a ton of music videos and you know, you can find Path of Blood there. And uh, Attack of the Demons is on VOD. I think it's on like Amazon and Vudu, and I feel like it's going to like most of the other major ones like iTunes and all that um, sort of trickling in. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, probably a, a Google search or, you know, any search will find it. <laughs> awesome, man. A Attack on the Demons is available on VOD through the usual suspects and DVD. It's out now. It it's a fun indie animated horror film. It's going to throw you back to the 90s. Eric Power, thank you so much for talking to me today. Yeah, thanks. This was really fun. Pleasure was mine, man. <laughs>